Hi guys, Matt Easton here. So recently I've spoken quite a bit about um, rapiers um, and uh, I don't want this to turn into a, a rapier only channel by any means because I'm by uh, no stretch uh, an expert on rapiers. Uh, but uh, there is one particular issue which I need to address that comes up time and time again and that is people talk about rapiers or respond to some of my assertions about rapiers um, making it very clear that what they think is a rapier is something like this. Okay, What this is is a 19th century fencing foil. Modern 20th century uh, and 21st century in fact fencing foils look a little bit different. They have a, a dish guard instead of this figure eight guard. But it, you'll see that it's a very, very uh, thin and in fact square section and very, very uh, flexible um, and flimsy, uh, in fact, blade. Okay? And uh, we've got to remember if, we're, if I'm talking about rapiers, I am not talking about a fencing foil. A fencing foil is an utterly different beast to a rapier, which is one of these. Okay? What are the key differences? Well, firstly, length. Okay, so the, um, the foil blade is usually, I believe, about 35, 34, 35 inches long. The rapier blade is usually about 40 inches or longer, so 40 to 45 inches long. So this, in fact, this example is 43. Um, so the rapier blade is considerably longer. Secondly, the rapier is a two-edged cut and thrust blade. Yes, it is specialised for the thrust, but that is a relative statement. It is specialised for the thrust in comparison to um, broadswords, backswords, longswords, uh, medieval arming swords, sabres and such like. Okay? It is nevertheless a cut and thrust sword. It might be longer and it might be narrower than a broadsword, but it can still cut. You can still sever tendons and uh, uh, lay parts of people's body open with this. It might not lop off limbs, but it is, however, going to um, cleave open, carve open uh, bits of people's body easily enough, unlike the weapon that this is simulating. The foil is a practice weapon for the small sword. Uh, and I've been talking a little bit recently about the small sword. The small sword is an utterly different uh, beast to the rapier. Now, I don't have a small sword. But what I do have is a small sword blade on a sabre hilt. Okay? This is a custom made sword from the 19th century where the uh, officer who ordered it obviously wanted a small sword uh, dueling blade for a conventional um, sabre hilt, in this case for the Scots Guards. Okay? Now, if you ignore the hilt on this and you imagine a hilt more like you see on this spadroon here. So the spadroon is basically a um, a, a, a something like a short rapier blade um, on a small sword hilt. The small sword hilt being characterised by this double shell guard, that is it has two shells either side of the blade, um, a little, usually a little quill on at the back and usually a knuckle bow at the front and a little pommel at the back there. Okay? So that is the type of hilt that you characteristically get on small swords. Um, but um, if we compare the two blades, the rapier and the small sword blade, the small sword blade is insanely lighter than the rapier. A rapier on average weighs uh, about two and a half pounds, okay? So it's about the same weight as a medieval one-handed sword. As I've mentioned in previous videos, all they have done with the rapier in making it specialised for the thrust is they've essentially taken the same amount of metal and they've squeezed it out into a longer, narrower blade and added more of a comprehensive guard at the back end. Okay? The small sword, however, is a very, very light weapon. Small swords regularly weigh in the region of 500 grams, something like that. So similar to a modern fencing foil or, or fencing epée, in fact. Okay? And some of them, in fact, were even lighter than that. So there's a huge difference in length and weight and the fact that the rapier is a two-edged cut and thrust sword the small sword, whilst some of them have a tiny bit of cutting capacity, generally speaking the small sword is a triangular blade, which I've talked about in a recent video, okay, so it's a triangular section blade, generally with no cutting capacity whatsoever, okay, so it's utterly specialised for the thrust. So in a sense, yes, the small sword is an evolution of the rapier, in that the rapier was 
if you take the side sword that came before it and the broadsword or, or, or arming sword that came before that. So the, the arming sword developed into the side sword and the side sword developed into the rapier. Okay? The side sword being essentially a medieval arming sword with a more protective hilt added to it. And then from there they extended the blade out longer and the blade got narrower, um, although it retained about the same weight. In some cases became even heavier as they tried to get the maximum length and reach possible. So the, the rapier did become more catered to the thrust and then gradually the cut um, basically got phased out altogether and late period rapiers, if you're looking at maybe the end of the 17th century when small swords start to come in, so you're talking about the 1670s, 1680s, 1690s, um, the uh, rapiers generally start to become even narrower and if you look at Spanish cup hilt rapiers from about 1700 you'll see what I'm talking about and what they have is essentially a long small sword blade on a rapier hilt and uh, or in, in Spanish case a cup hilt okay and um, essentially outside of Spain in most parts of uh, Europe the uh, small sword then took over um, so it's very important as I mentioned to reiterate that a foil is an utterly different beast to a rapier. A rapier is a big, long, one-handed sword that can cut and thrust. Okay? A, a, a foil is the practice weapon for the small sword. Okay? Notice that the, the blade, in this case, again by coincidence, I have a lot of coincidences in my videos, is exactly the same length, and the weight and balance is not too different between the small sword and the foil. Now, in the middle of the 19th century, there was a call for a practice weapon that was a little bit closer to the dueling weapon. Now you have to put that in context because the dueling weapon by the middle of the 19th century um, was not really the sword. Okay? By the 19th century dueling had been made illegal in most parts of Europe and indeed rather than just being illegal and people still doing it, it had been made illegal and people had more or less stopped doing it. And there were only a couple of parts really of Europe where, um, where dueling happened with any regularity and even there it was very rare, those two places being France and Italy. Uh, in Italy a special type of sabre was developed with a very light blade um, used to cut and usually it had the point ground off so you couldn't thrust with it or at least it wasn't allowed to thrust with it and you could only give very light flesh wounds with a cut and in France the uh, épée de combat um, or the, the, the dueling sword was brought in, um, essentially, uh, and that was a thrust only weapon with a small sword blade, that is a triangular blade on it. And of course people realised that the square blade of the foil wasn't a very good simulator for the triangular blade, so what they brought in was, ta-da, what you know as the epée. Okay? I should mention at this point, I uh, learned to foil fence at school and I learned epee fencing a little bit later um, when I was in my 20s. At university I did uh, sport sabre fencing. So I have done all three weapons, however I have the least experience with epee. The rules of each of them are a little bit different, uh, even though superficially the epee and the foil are somewhat similar blades. The epee is heavier and stiffer um, and it has a larger bell guard on it. Okay? And the epee was essentially brought in to represent or, or simulate training for the French duel to first blood with the point. Okay? Now, there were um, occasionally situations where people decided to duel to, to the death, but these, I don't actually know of any documented examples during, uh, during the 19th century. If you do know of any, feel free to uh, comment about them below this video. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, the duel in France where, where the epée was developed um, was essentially you were aiming to poke the person anywhere on their body, it could be their hand, it could be their toe, it could be their face, um, poke them with your sword to settle a matter of honour and gain first blood. Of course in some situations and perhaps even uh, a good percentage of the situations, both people poked each other at the same time, as happens in modern epee fencing because of these crazy rules that you only have to stab the other person 0.3 of a second before they stab you, which in HEMA would be much frowned upon. Um, but uh, because you poked the person first, you would have been deemed to have uh, scored the first blood and you would have been seen as the winner. Um, so these are not life or death duels for the most part, 
These are first blood duels, a very different beast, very different situation. And they have a very strict uh, code of etiquette that go along with them as well. Uh, and seconds were involved and so on. I won't go into the details of that in this video. Um, so ironically, the Epe was developed to uh, simulate the dueling sword of the 19th century, but what they actually used for blade section was a triangular section blade, which you can buy from any modern fencing supplier as an epee blade, that the triangular blade is actually closer to the small sword blade, the triangular small sword blade, than the foil blade was. So we have a kind of paradox here, because actually the practice weapon for the small sword was the foil, but the epee was developed 100 years later, and the epee is actually closer to the small sword than the foil was. Uh, but the epee is the practice weapon for the epee de combat, not the small sword. So you have a strange paradox, a strange kind of circle there. But the result is that most modern HEMA practitioners who practice small sword fencing tend to use a replica small sword hilt with an epee blade. Okay? Um, now I will talk a little bit about that in the future, whether that's the right thing to do, because historically speaking the foil was actually the practice weapon for the, epic, for the um, small sword, uh, but I'll, I'll save that for a future video. But the important headlines I want to make are, to recap, the epee blade and the small sword blade are very similar. They are triangular, hollow, hollow ground blades, and they're super, super light. They're stiff, super light. You could never cut with one, you can only thrust with it. It is a, it is a poker. They are utterly different to the rapier. The rapier is longer, heavier, it is a cut and thrust edged blade. It's just a much bigger blade. You can't compare it at all really with triangular small sword and epee blades. And equally, the foil is the lightest of them all and it is a square section blade, very thin, very flimsy. Um, and really the foil, in literal terms, can't really be compared very accurately with any real swords. The foil was a supposedly a safe practice weapon for the small sword. But foils and rapiers should never be compared. They're utterly different beasts. It's like comparing a, a, a spear with a, with a, a spear with a small sword. Okay? They're utterly different. Okay, hope that's helpful to some people. Thank you.